Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Actually, I'm planning to turn not the whole conference, but at least the conference theme a little bit um, from head to, to feet. So I'm, I'm also focusing like on development policy and climate change rather than on climate change and development policy. And that obviously is inspired by the Arab awakening, which, which really brings a lot of change to the whole region. But still, um, I'm trying to, you know, point to the linkages between Arab awakening, development policy, more specifically, I'm going to focus on food security, and then also bring the climate change um, into the picture. Let me give you a, a brief overview, and instead of bullet points, I decided why not put a, a couple of pictures there. So, there's still a big question of why the Arab awakening happened, what are the consequences and so on. And there are a lot of theories out there. And I'm just going to focus on two of our recent studies at IFPRI. Um, one is looking at data issues, whether or not you know the whole gloom, um, uh, rather optimistic picture that has been shown in terms of uh, rapid economic growth and so on. It's actually also reflected in the data, and if so, how is that possible? Then we're going to look at, you know, the broader kind of picture in terms of conflict. There's a lot of, you know, uprisings um, ranging from protests to war. So we're going to look to the history um, with cross-country regressions and to see, you know, how the Arab awakening um, food security and potentially high food prices then related also to climate change may, may have impacted that. Then we're going to look um, at climate change. We have done three country case studies in Tunisia, Syria and Yemen, just uh, reporting a, a few of those results using CGE models. And um, then I would also like to present you some of our future plans. To most people, the Arab awakening came as a big surprise. Nobody really expected what was going on. Um, official numbers looked good, so there was, was not a real indication of um, an uprising coming. So the, the thing that we did first is, okay, let's take a look, revisit a lot of the numbers that are out there. And if you look at official poverty rates, for example, um, you will see a, a rather optimistic picture. Poverty in the region is relatively low. Um, even more so if you look at Gini coefficients uh, from the World Development Indicators or from any government website, you will also see, well, everything is fine. I mean, Egypt, if you trust the numbers, is a more equal society than Switzerland with a Gini coefficient of 0.2 something. So, you know, even from that you start to kind of question some of, some of the numbers. So, but more specifically, um, we compare two things to get a grasp of how pro-poor was, was growth in, in the past. To your left, you see um, a graph that shows on the x-axis the number of poor people. On the y-axis, you see per capita income. Um, the upper line shows you the world trend, and obviously you see the higher per capita income, the more poverty goes down. That's to be expected. However, if you look at the Arab world, which is the black line down there, you will see that actually growth has been more pro-poor in the Arab world than in the rest of the world. Now, if you go to anybody familiar with the region would say there must be something wrong here. And we also did some cross-country regressions to show that, that this cannot possibly be the case. Now, to show perhaps a more realistic picture, we also look at alternative development indicators. And in that case, we focus on child malnutrition in terms of stunting. Why? It's a, it captures a multiple dimension, plus it's available for all the countries from demographic and health surveys. Now, if you believe child stunting is a good proxy for, for poverty, then you will also come to the conclusion, well, uh, maybe growth was not all that pro-poor after all, because you see on that right-hand graph there, the relationship is exactly the, the other way around. So 
growth in the uh, rest of the world um, was better for improving nutrition than in the Arab world. So there's, there's a lot of doubt on the, on the data front. In addition, um, you know, we all like researchers look at different data sources. So, so there's another great data source, especially when it comes to coverage um, and recent data, which is the Gallup World Poll. So what we did now, starting from 2005, ranging until 2011, um, we used the question from the Gallup World Poll, and as you know, that's a perception-based survey. It's conducted twice every year in all the countries in the world, representative at, and on, on the national level. So one of the questions they are asking is, um, uh, how satisfied are you with your standard of living? Another question is, did you at any point in time over the last year have enough food to eat? So you could think of the first question as a, as a welfare indication, the second one as a food security kind of indication. Now, if you plot both of them, and this is just the standard of living question, um, you will see on the x-axis, again, it's the, the percentage of dissatisfied people. Then on the y-axis, again, per capita income, then the size of the bubble tells you something about the number of dissatisfied people and the color tells you something about the change over time. Now, first of all, you see that um, as expected with growing income, um, the percentage of dissatisfied people goes kind of down. But still, if you look at the colors, you see a lot of orange and red even on the right-hand side. And um, so, in many of those countries with, with riots and revolution, Egypt, Yemen, and so on, um, uh, you, you, you could have actually told by the data that there's something going on in terms of the people being unhappy. Now, we are not saying that economics is all that played the role. Of course, um, if we look at the Tahrir Square pictures, there's a lot about dignity, justice, and so on. But I think we are safe to say that Economics also played a role. Now coming to food security, um, intuitively it's clear that food security, high food prices um, play, play a role. But what we did, again, to bring some uh, empirical evidence to the, to the table, we looked at data from 1960 to 2010, and we ran a cross-country regression um, in terms of conflict events in the whole region, and then the major determining factors. Now, um, Collier and Hoofler and others uh, find that in the global sample, economic growth and income play a, a big role in terms of determining conflict. Um, and we just wanted to see if, if the same holds true for the Arab world. And coming back to our, our, our previous argument that economic growth didn't trickle down to, to, to the poor and the people. Uh, we were just curious to see um, how that plays out. Now, without going into much detail about this paper of my colleague uh, Maistad, and you, you see the, the link for all the details there, it emerges that food security um, really played a major role in causing conflict over the last 50 years um, in the Arab world. Now, again, this data doesn't include um, data set from, from the Arab awakening <coughs> itself, but it's just another indication looking forward uh, for a successful transition, um, avoiding conflict. Um, it seems to be critical for policymakers to address um, the food security issue. And by the way, um, we tested um, an indicator of food security more at the national macro level and more as on, on, on a household level, and they both are highly significant. But talking about uh, food security, and you know slowly but surely I'm, I'm, I'm getting to, to the climate change, but really I think all of these three things are, are interrelated and it's, and it's important to, to, to capture them all. Um, so this is our food security framework, not only for Arab countries, but in general. 
And I don't want you to like look at the whole thing or I don't run you through the whole um, graph, but it's just important to notice that we put a lot of emphasis on the macro level or national level of food security and the micro level. In terms of macro level and if we think indicators and quantitative analysis, um, we are using um, an indicator that is a ratio of the total food imports to total exports plus remittances because as you may know in the region still especially older people think food security in terms of self-sufficiency and here we make a strong statement that food security and self-sufficiency have very little to do with each other as expressed mm -hmm. in that indicator as well. In fact, um, all the Arab countries are net food importers and agricultural potential in most countries is rather limited. So our, some of our major messages in terms of food security is rather than only looking at agriculture and, how to, and trying to increase productivity, we need to look at that in a, in a much more uh, broader sense. And that has to include trade, that has to obviously include um, economic growth, um, that, has, that has to include, um, especially on the micro level, also things like health, education and nutrition uh, at the same time. Now what we have done is we mapped out um, those uh, indicators on the macro and micro level. And so here you obviously see that most of the oil exporting countries like Libya and the Gulf countries, um, but also others like Iran, since they have high revenues from exports, they, 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 there shouldn't be any big issue in terms of being able to import food. However, um, there's also a micro dimension to food insecurity. And here again, we use that indicator that I was talking about, child, child malnutrition. And you can see um, the colors are pretty different between countries that have a, a macro issue. That means being able to import food slash produce food at the same time and the nutritional situation of households and specifically children, um, which obviously has a lot of policy implications. So broadly speaking, if the country has a macro issue, then obviously you need very different policies and investment than countries with a micro issue of things. And just brief, brief uh, a comment on the methodology. We use a global sample of countries and then we divide all the countries in quintiles, both for the macro and micro indicator. And, and we rank them from, from low to extremely alarming um, on a global sample. That's important to note. Okay, so now coming to climate change and we had this in the previous um, session. Um, just very briefly, I mean, there are yeah, you could think of biophysical impact and you could think of economic effects. So biophysical is more frequent droughts and floods, sea level rise, and then uh, yields that come from changes in temperature and yields and so on. And then economic impacts um, could be on the budget, could be changing prices, etc. So now what, what, what we have done, and we have discussed this before in the, in, in the session, rather than only looking at the local, let me, let me run you through this, rather than only looking, using a CGE model to assess the impacts within the country, we also say, okay, food security plays a very important role in Arab countries, they are, most of them are net food importing countries. So surely what happens in the rest of the world should to some extent impact those countries as well through higher food prices. And so not only do we use like national level CGE models for those three countries that I, that, that I um, mentioned before, but we also use um, price changes, global food price changes as projected by IFPRI's um, 
uh, impact model to shock the country CGE models in terms of changes in, in, in prices. And so let me just give you a brief overview. So, so this is um, kind of the underlying data for um, the impact model as well as for um, the, the, the crop modeling. Um, just a, a, a few examples. So we, we use, generally speaking, two uh, GCMs. One is MIROC and the other CSI. And this is just an example of pretty consistently in most cases, in most crops, not all of them, but most of them, um, yields go down. And this is kind of the story that, that we are expecting. Um, that, that's on the local level. Now if you look at the global level, these are the projected price changes um, uh, for maize, rice and wheat. What you see here is the blue is basically the expected price increase for maize, rice and wheat respectively, even without climate change. That's due to you know, population growth, changing dietary patterns and so on. And then depending on which GCM you're using, um, your price effects on the global level goes up and reaches up to 100%, 55, 54 respectively for, for those crops um, between 2010 and 2050. Um, so now, um, and, and you can see all the details in the paper, but the general story is, okay, so both the local effect and the global effect have a, have a strong impact and depending on the net food importing position of the country and the net food producing position of households or consuming pro, um, position of households, um, the impact varies. But the general story is there is a strong impact on households over time, but they vary between uh, countries, both in terms of size and also in terms of which group you are looking at. And here we are disaggregating between uh, farm, non-farm and urban households. And so interestingly enough, and in the case of Turkey, I guess uh, we'll see that specifically. So in some circumstances, if global food prices go up and the local impacts will be rather small, a farmer may actually gain, even though his yields may go down a bit, but from the global food prices um, going, going up, that, that there may actually be much less um, impact um, than, than, than there would be if we only look at um, the local effects. So, sorry, just, just the key messages. So there's an urgent need to improve the data, and that's not new, but this is the, the message that, that we, are, we are carrying. Then economics played a role in the Arab awakening, that's pretty clear, and also food security will have to play an important role for successful and peaceful transition. And finally, the key point, if we think climate change, uh, taking global development into account really matters. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.